Hello, good evening to you. Welcome. This is Ghana Tonight. We are live from our news up here at Tadesawe Kanda. Also live on Tuesday Ghana on Facebook, BSV Channel 279. All across the world on 3news.com. I am out for the concert. Tonight, showdown in court as lawyers of the embattled former sanitation minister, Cecilia Abna Dapa, fiercely oppose OSP's application for the confirmation of order of freezing and seizure of Cecilia Dapa's account and money in the, these accounts and what were found in their home. We'll give you an update on that. Plus, uh, day one of the two-day ECOWAS Security Chiefs meeting in Accra ends. We'll tell you what issues were on the table for discussion, including the Defense Minister's call on Army Chiefs to remain loyal to their presidents. We'll get into all of that. Stay with us here on Ghana Tonight. Also, the minority in Parliament has invoked the right to information law to demand answers to questions surrounding the controversial new Bank of Ghana headquarters project. Tonight, we hear from the minority what exactly they seek from the Bank of Ghana. Stay with us here on Ghana Tonight. All these issues are of concern to you. And that's exactly why it is of concern to us. And we're going to be talking together with you as always. Let's hear from you. The hashtag is Ghana Tonight on Facebook and Twitter. Let's get talking. Let's set for Ghana, please. The chairperson of the Electoral Commission, Jean Mensah, has reaffirmed the Commission's decision to use the Ghana card as the sole voter registration document despite Parliament's disapproval. The Commission has set December 19 for the district level elections with registration of persons who have turned 18 years from September 12 to October 2 at its district offices. Article 45A mandates the Electoral Commission to compile the register of voters at such periods that may be determined by law. It is in the discharge of this mandate and as part of the Commission's preparations towards the conduct of the 2023 district level elections that the Commission will undertake a voters registration exercise. The Domahini Osadjifo Osadiyayo Ajiman Bidu II has criticized the construction of the new Bank of Ghana head office describing the project as a misplaced priority. He argued that the funds could have been diverted to other critical areas. Bank of Ghana says it is using $250 million to build a new head office. What is this? Because they are autonomous, they just choose to do anything they like. How can Bank of Ghana alone decide to undertake such a project? The family of the 17-year-old Washington Bay attendant who is alleged to have been assaulted by the police leading to his death says it will seek legal redress. They have warned the police not to conduct the autopsy on the body without their permission and involvement. The police officers are alleged to have assaulted Samuel Kwesi after he had splashed water on them while washing a car at a washing bay at Mamaso in the Brim North District of the Eastern Region. The whole Ghana, IDP, Naswati said, I want the IGP and authorities to explain if that is how the law works in Ghana. The police came for my brother's body and we don't know where they have taken the body to. Husband of former sanitation minister Cecilia Dapa has been released on bail without a charge after being arrested by the Office of the Special Prosecutor to aid in investigations. Director of Prosecutions at the OSP told the court that Daniel Osaikofo was picked up because alleged tainted monies had been found in the matrimonial home of the former minister. But counsel for Cecilia Dapa noted that her client was unaware of the recent development. The court has set August 31, 
to rule on a confirmation application filed by the Office of the Special Prosecutor to freeze the assets and accounts of the former sanitation minister. A professor at the University of Ghana, Ransford Jampo, has been elected president of the University of Ghana branch of the University Teachers Association of Ghana, UTAG. He was elected with 93% of the total valid votes cast. In the driving seat, myself, I'll champion the interest of my people forcefully and proactively. I lost some friends as general secretary and I do not mind losing more as I fight harder for the university teacher in my capacity as president, he said in a message. Well, there's more news on 3news.com. Make some time and visit 3news.com. Coming up here next on Ghana Tonight. We we'll go straight into the happenings in court earlier today. There was a showdown in court as lawyers of the embattled former sanitation minister, Cecilia Abna Dapa, fiercely opposed the Office of Special Prosecutor's application for the confirmation of an order of freezing and seizure of Cecilia Dapes accounts and the monies were, that were also retrieved from her Abilimpe residence. Now, we have details of the happenings in court earlier today. You recall that the special prosecutor had actually gone to court today to extend the period of the freezing of her, her accounts, which we showed to you. Uh, accounts about seven bank accounts held in two banks and also some unspecified amounts of monies in there plus some over two million and, and CDs and some five a little over five hundred and sixty thousand dollars that were retrieved in uh, Belink Bay home plus the one million that is said to have been stolen but the husband of a former sanitation minister Cecilia Abnandapa has also been released on bail without a charge after being arrested by the Office of Special Prosecutor to aid in investigations. Now, the Director of Prosecutions at the OSP told the court that Daniel Osekufu was picked up by uh, police because the alleged tainted monies had been in the matrimonial home of the former minister. But there was some <laughs> disagreement in there, and that's why my colleague, Dennis Paberi Wadam, uh, who's, who monitored this uh, court uh, proceedings earlier today is joining me in studio. Dennis, we understand this was a, a virtual court hearing. They, they weren't present. They did it over Zoom. Yes, that's, that's right. Because um, the courts are on legal vacation. And what that means is that they try to, um, like the courts are, shouldn't have been working on okay. the superior courts. But for some of these cases, they try to find a way of managing it mm -hmm. at, with, within the convenience of the parties. So this was one of the cases that um, have been scheduled to be held virtually. So I because see. of that, parties are wherever they are, they are, and then they are able to make their submissions via Google uh, meetings. What, so what do we know? What, what did we get from the proceedings earlier today? Well, so, I mean, essentially, um, today's meeting or today's uh, proceeding was mm -hmm. for the OSP to make a case for the freezing orders and then the order of seizure to be confirmed by the courts. Um, we have already gone into the details of why the OSP is seeking to freeze the account of mm -hmm. Cecilia Abnadapa and also to seize the money which was retrieved from her homes somewhere on the 26th of July 2023. Mm -hmm. um, so what emerged in court today largely were issues that had to do with um, whether or not the money that was retrieved from Cecilia Dapa's house is tainted property. Mind you, the Office of the Special Prosecutor or the, OA, uh, the Special Prosecutor is in court because he wants to continue to keep the money that was retrieved from the home of Cecilia Dapa. Mm -hmm. And he's doing so because he believes that money is tainted. I see. And per the OSP Act, under Section 32, he has the power to do so. Mm -hmm. But he has to make an application within seven days. It might be seven days. will come to it because it's also a matter of controversy that came up in court. I see. So that is the basis on which he made the application. But, I mean, for the OSP, the OSP is convinced that that particular money is tainted money for which reason he wants to seize the money. And that's why he wants the order of seizure confirmed. 
But the lawyers for Cecilia Dapa or the lawyer for Cecilia Dapa maintains that the money in question does not um, conform with the definition of what tainted money or tainted property is as provided for under the uh, OSP Act and of course also the uh, uh, Anti-Money Laundering Act. Mm -hmm. So that was a matter of... Um, and so that's the quote the, of the lawyer. Yeah, so that's it. the quote of the lawyer in here. That the mere fact that sums of money were found in Cecilia the past matrimonial home is not ground to suspect that the money is tainted property as defined by the OSP. It doesn't end there. They go, the lawyer goes on to make another point about the role of the the role that our banks also have to play or responsibility that they have mm -hmm. to report suspicious transactions. I see. And they make the case that. And this is the exact quote from the, the lawyer, that there is no basis to suspect that monies in Cecilia the past accounts are tainted property, especially when banks are routinely required on a daily basis to report suspicious transactions. So the point essentially made is that if that money sitting in the banks, which mm -hmm. they seek to freeze, are suspicious um, are tainted property mm -hmm. because the banks are required under our anti-money laundering laws to routinely report suspicious transactions this would have been done long before the osp um, mm -hmm. gets into this see, the so other issue also had to do with the time in which the application was made that's right now the lawyer for the respondent respondent in this case is cecilia dapa says that the osp by by the statutory provisions have a certain time period to apply to get these orders confirmed so in the case of the the order for seizure, it has to be done within seven days. And that for the freezing order has to be done within 14 days. It is the contention of the lawyer for the respondent that looking at the time that the OSP went to search the respondent's home to get the money and the time that, that application, um, the application, uh, application was made, mm -hmm. it is out of time. I see. So that also came up as one of the things that um, was looked at. Mm -hmm. And now, so, there was also the, uh, another interesting thing that came up, and I'll show you what. Mm -hmm. Now, look at this. This is from paragraph 10 of the OSP's affidavit in support. Okay. Now, remember, this was sworn to by one of the state attorneys, mm -hmm. um, together with the, uh, the motion that they filed. Now, in there, read carefully that on 24th July two, 2023, the mm -hmm. OSP placed the respondent under arrest on charges of corruption and corruption-related offenses. Right. But we're told by the director of prosecution at the office of the OSP that the respondent has not been charged yet. So but even though this was stated here, we are told that it's not been charged. That is some clarification or explanation. That was what played out. I see. It so was also along that line that we also got to know that the husband of Cecilia Dapa was also arrested and granted bail. With no charges? With no charges. In so, fact, it means that neither of them has been charged. So essentially, the, o the OSP in, in that earlier statement yes. said Cecilia In fact, Adapa, it's a document before the court. It's a document. It's and the that's what affidavit you the court. Yes. That Cecilia Dapa was under arrest on, on charges, charges of, of corruption, corruption and corruption-related corruption related offenses. offenses. The OSP subsequently conducted searches in three residential properties associated with the respondents at cantonments at Belém, and Tassano in Accra. So this is just the extract of the paragraph 10 of that. But then in court today, yes, it came up that she has not actually not, not been, been charged. charged. So why is it disconnect? Whose report are we believing? Why is the OSP putting it in the statement that she was actually charged with corruption, corruption-related activities? And then in court today, it, it comes to light that she's not being charged. She has been arrested or put under arrest on these charges, but that she has not been charged mm -hmm. yet. She's okay. still under investigation. At least that's what, that was what happened in court today. Dennis, thank you. Um, in the interest and in the spirit of accountability and then also some level of transparency, we here at uh, Media General, by extension, for us here on Ghana tonight. Today, we submitted the, what we made a request to the Auditor General for the details of the asset declaration of Cecilia Dapa. And that's what you see on the screen there. So 
in the interest of the public and in the spirit of transparency and accountability for us here at Media General and indeed on Ghana tonight, we have made an official request for the asset declaration uh, that is to de know whether Cecilia Dapa actually declared her assets or not and specifically the ministers as to whether the ministers of this current administration have declared their assets or not so that's the form that you see on the screen there and that's my colleague Lord Edouard Sari who submitted this asset declaration request and that's what you see on the screen by media general and Ghana tonight to the auditor general's department we want to know whether they have declared their assets as demanded by law and these are the, the pages of the forms that we earlier submitted to the auditor general earlier today so that's the information in the interest of the public and for transparency and accountability within this lord edward sari submitted the forms to the auditor general lord so tell me when you submitted the forms who received it and what did they say afterwards right so after this afternoon i went to the auditor general's mm -hmm. um, department i submitted um, i first got to the reception mm -hmm. asked for where they asked me what my mission was i introduced myself and told them that I had a letter for the Auditor General. Mm -hmm. And so I was directed to go to a room labeled Correspondence. Mm -hmm. And while I, when I got there, I was introduced to the Information Officer. Mm -hmm. And so I introduced myself again to the Information Officer, gave him the brown envelope that contained a request. And he skimmed through it and then he told me that, okay, they had received it and that um, they would follow through with it and then they'll give us feedback and everything. So I, I followed up and asked them that, okay, so what, what happens from here? And you know, once you file it, there are a number of days that the, uh, the Auditor General is supposed to get back to you on that. And so they noted that once we have provided our details on this request, on the form, they would get back to us and as and when they, they, they do they, that. They, I, I see. And um, it, we have to also put it on um, some emphasis on the fact that it is in the interest of the public. Indeed, indeed. Alfred. That we're doing this. Exactly. You, you recall the um, interview we had with one of the uh, members of parliament who mm -hmm. had noted that, of course, he was confident that the parliamentarians had all um, declared their assets mm -hmm. and a number of um, public officials had also, had also done that. So we are doing this following through um, to make sure that, indeed, all the appointees, as far as the ministers are concerned, of the president have also filed their um, asset declarations. And apart from the filing of the assets, we wanted to know the dates on which these asset declaration forms um, were, were filled. Indeed, it's a very important point, the yeah. dates as well. So we're finding out whether the appointees of this administration have submitted their Indeed. asset declaration form. The date they submitted their asset declaration yeah. forms, if it's consistent with what the law requires them to do. Exactly. And then also whether indeed uh, they have fulfilled all the requirements under the asset declaration. Yes, Alfred. And I, I'd like to add to it that on the request, we know so that these, this request that we're making, we wanted, wanted to know as of December 2022. Okay. Right? The minister that had filed these the asset assets as of December 2022. We need to put that on record. Super. That's Lord Edward Sari there. And uh, it's one of my, my producers here on Ghana Tonight. He's also our chief court correspondent. Uh, he submitted these uh, forms as we're demanding some information from the Auditor General, specifically Indeed. about these appointees of the, this administration, whether they have fulfilled all righteousness in also um, submitting and filling their asset declaration forms as, as requested by law or required by law. But Dennis, so what does the law say now that we've done this? When are we supposed to get any response from the Auditor General with our request? So now that the request has been duly submitted, um, we expect that in the next 14 days a decision will be made as uh, required under the law mm -hmm. as to whether we'll get the information or not. That should be communicated to us in writing. And if that is done, then it will indicate to us um, if we can get the information exactly as we requested or get a part of it. 
and if we are only getting a part of it, a reason will be given why we cannot get the other part of it. If they, also, if they decide to give us, it also indicates how much it will cost us to get that kind of information. And when you read um, Section 23 of the Right to Information Act, mm -hmm. Act 989, you see all the processes that have been done there. And this is a regular application. I but see. when it goes under the agent, um, there's an application that you can do it when you need the information urgently. And that will be with respect to where there's the need to um, get the liberty of somebody and then there's reasonable grounds for that to be done. Mm -hmm. They would get back to you within 48 hours as to whether you get the information or not. So yes, now that we have submitted this, in the next 14 days, we expect to get some response on that particular matter. Cool. What it also means is that if by 14 days time we do not get a response, it is deemed that the institution has refused to give us the information. So in, in which case, we can apply to the head of the institution for an internal review. If we are not still able to get it, then we can head to the right, of, to, right to Information Commission where we can have that matter head. If we are not satisfied, we can head to the High Court to have it determined. Super. So in the interest of the public, we intend to go through the process every step of the way to make sure that we get the information as we have requested through the legal process. Thank you, Dennis. Appreciate it. Thank you so much. Um, Dennis Barberi Wadam and Lord Edouard and thank you. Um, the, uh, the producers here on Ghana tonight, and then also together with the media general, we have made this request. And in the next 14 days, beginning today, we will do the countdown to hear, hopefully, from the auditor general on our request. But coming up next, the minority in parliament has invoked the right to information law to demand answers to questions surrounding the controversial new Bank of Ghana headquarters project. Tonight, we hear from the minority exactly what are they demanding. And, and if you go into... Mama Yarga is joining us right after this quick break, and he signed that letter on behalf of the minority chief whip. It's going to be engaging us on exactly what they are asking the Bank of Ghana to provide with respect to this new building, the headquarters. Stay with us. We'll be back shortly after this quick break. Ladies and gentlemen, we're going to demonstrate to you the superior properties of Flamingo Paint as compared to other paint brands on the market. We take equal quantities of flamingo paint and this ordinary paint. We then dilute them with water. And now, let the test begin. The gentleman on the left is going to apply the ordinary paint and the gentleman on my right will use the flamingo superior paint. As you can clearly see, flamingo has the obvious better hiding. Furthermore, flamingo has painted a much larger area. You know, one bucket of flamingo paint is equal to several buckets of any other paint brand on the market. Flamingo paint is made with superior formulation to give superior durability, superior hiding, superior coverage. Flamingo paint, simply superior. Hey, Ojam, you're looking good, oh my friend. Is that something you're not telling me? Yes, I'm feeling very good and strong. What is the secret? It is not a secret. My farmer used Yara Miller Activa on me two weeks after planting. This boosted my growth. Then after, he used Yara Bella Sulfan as top dressing when I was at knee length. My goodness and strength is because of Yara Miller Activa and Yara Bella Sulfan. Yara fertilizers have nitrite based fertilizers that are readily available for plant upkeep and do not over acidify the soil. Yara fertilizers also contain micronutrients such as zinc, boron and manganese which aid in yield and crop quality. If you want to look good like me, then your farmer must go for Yara fertilizers. They are available in accredited agri-input shops nationwide. For more information, call 0308-251-060 or visit our webpage at yara.com.gh or Facebook page. And there is more. Yara retailers can also benefit from selling Yara products by just downloading Yara Connect app and scanning QR codes on the Yara sack at the point of sale to end rewards. Use Yara fertilizers for better yields and quality produce. Everybody knows Acrobato. 
And if you know acrobato, it means you know M Punch Homeopathy Clinic. M Punch Homeopathy Clinic is my pillar. Let's hear what others are saying about M Punch Homeopathy Clinic. Who will be careful M Punch Wana? Ha! Just an amyan Cassami Prod, and let's say problems room. It's not my own idea, mammy. Papa patches and any other some kitua. I'm quite points, you know, shame me with your monom baby be an awesome woman, do mammy do me fine, and my own cram, you know, who for one I'm quite more. Eba, and everything yourself. Be mammy, no, I do, Joe, and the whole me, Nancy. And then you call end point, or mamma, and then the white dear, what's me, I'm sorry, Nancy. That's end point for you. Oh, my brother, too. Hello, hey, what should you watch? Okay, a free bra would be end point, what does it? I'm a choir. I just say my name quickly, and pass on my name in and imagine a sabema. Now, when we feel for you, the one in the jars. You got everything. I have secret. M point is my secret. M point homeopathic clinic. I'm free. They came, they saw, and are set to conquer. Ghana's strongest 2023 is at an end, and four men will compete for the title in the grand finale. Who wins this year's Ghana's strongest? Will it be Godfrey Akobila? With seven appearances, Bright Apia, the Swatman, Takrada's finest, Ebenezer Amos, or the new man, Jeffrey Ekufu. Don't miss this epic finale live on TV3 at the Obra Sport on Sunday, 20th August at 2 p.m. Ghana's Strongest, the power to do. Gosh, Ghana's Strongest, this Sunday, only on TV3. Ghana's Strongest is powered by Gassem, the nation builder. Brought to you by Mixi Choco, Channel Hot, Deluxe Acrylic Paint, Dragnet. This water pouring on you from the rooftop signifies that in this life, rain shall fall on you, but nothing shall happen to you. It's a week of fashion and glam on Ghana's Most Beautiful. This week, our beautiful contestants will grace the runway, showcasing exquisite outfits crafted by talented designers and featuring the latest collections from GTP. Get ready to be dazzled as they bring elegance, charm and a touch of Ghanaian culture to the fashion world. It's a night of style, sophistication and celebration. We're Fashion meets tradition in a breathtaking display of creativity and beauty. Exclusively on TV3 at 8 p.m. this Sunday. It's an eviction week and not less than two contestants will be evicted. To save your contestant from eviction, vote by dialing star 713 star 13 hush or download the TV3 reality app to vote. GMB 2023, Ghana's beauty. Africa's pride. GMB 2023 is sponsored by Gino Tomato Mix, GTP, Techno Common 20 Series, AT, Pepsodent Charcoal and Lemon Infused Formula and Pepsodent Natural Herbal Formula, Geisha Moringa and Geisha Black Soup, Key Soup, Bell Pack Tissues, Sankofa Natural Spices, Vita Milk, Deluxe Acrylic Paint, Nescofa Blood Tonic, Heaven Black Mosquito Spray and Coil, Enapa Foods, Freedom from Casa Precon, Frutelli Calipo, Duffy's Health and Beauty, Obuasi Betes, Nubna Womuankasa, Dragnet, Shalatem, Top Choku, Global Wings Travel and Tour. Makeup was done by House of Tara. Welcome back. This is Ghana Tonight. The Minority Caucus in Parliament has given the Bank of Ghana seven days to provide information on the cost of its new headquarters in Accra, as per Section 18 of the Right to Information Act. We have that statement from uh, the minority, uh, going to be on the screen shortly. Uh, they are seeking details on the land procurement processes, consultants and uh, project managers, financing arrangements, and, and the cost scope of work and so on, a number of things. Now, this, if you look at the Public Procurement Act 2003, Act 663, as amended, specifically Section 38 of, of that Act, which is going to be on the screen shortly, uh, the Public Procurement Act, which they make reference to the specific aspect of that particular law, it says a procurement entity may, for reasons of economy and efficiency and subject to the approval of the board, engage in procurement by means of restricted tendering if goods 
works or services are available only from a limited number of suppliers or contractors or if the time and cost required to examine and evaluate a large number of tenders is dis disproportionate to the value of the goods, works or services to be procured. Mama Yarga is Member of Parliament for the Boko Central Constituency. He signed this statement issued on behalf of the Minority Chief Whip. Governor Kwame Abuja is joining me on, on, on Zoom now. Jairaga, thank you so much for joining us here on Ghana tonight. First of all, let's start off with this. Now, have you detected some inconsistency, especially in the reported cost of this Bank of Ghana headquarters under construction? Reason why you're, you're making this particular demand? Well, fundamentally, as a minority, we have stated our opposition to the fact of the governor and his deputies and board deciding to construct such a huge edifice at that cost at a time when the bank is collapsing. They are incurring devastating losses and registering negative equity and failing fundamentally to position themselves to be able to salvage the financial sector should there be any unforeseen crisis. So we are opposed to that decision in the first place. But it is becoming even scarier because we are getting conflicting reports about the actual cost of the project. As you can see from some documents uh, claiming to be records of the Public Procurement Authority, this is a project that started at an estimated cost of 81 million United States dollars, had moved to 121 million United States dollars within a short period of about eight months. And then we are now told that the project is estimated to cost about 250 million United States dollars at a time when the bank is collapsing. So we are fundamentally opposed to that decision, but we are now very interested in how the price would have escalated from an estimated 81 million to 275, uh, 250 million United States dollars. And then the documents also, you know, uh, uh, point to uh, procurement breaches, which are criminal in the sense that the procurement processes were clearly not transparent. It wasn't competitive for such a, a major project. You will think that it will be competitive, but if you are not going to be competitive, you will have to really establish a strong case why you are not going to be competitive. But the documents that we have seen do not point in these directions. And so we have become very interested in what really happened in relation to the procurement of the uh, new Bank of Ghana headquarters building. So we've written to the bank to request for information. Uh, and specifically, we want to know the procurement processes uh, that led to the procurement of this uh, project, the price as the cost, how the project is going to be financed, where the payments are going to be coming from, uh, how it was budgeted for, and how it has been paid if payments have been effected. We are interested in the issues of uh, consultants and project managers that have been procured, uh, how were they procured and uh, at what cost, and uh, who are they. And then also we are interested in the land on which the project uh, is taking place. Uh, whose land was it? How did it move from that person to the Bank of Ghana for them to be uh, constructing this headquarters building on? How much did they pay that person? Or if they have a lease arrangement, uh, what is the lease arrangement that they have? What are the terms? So we want total transparency in relation to uh, this project. We've given them seven days because this is information that should be readily available. They don't need to go anywhere to search for it. It's, it's with them. They, 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 they couldn't have gotten a contractor to site without 
procuring. And so they must have a file that has all these, uh, these pieces of information. And so we ask them for uh, this, and we think that seven days is enough time for them to be able to respond to us in terms of our well, request for information. But your, so your, your, your we colleague, will know what our next steps will be. Your colleague, Samuel Okujato Blackwell, for instance, also released some documents uh, on his social media handle earlier today we tends to also raise fundamental procurement questions We've seen some of the documents now and the criteria that was used in selecting the companies the bank of ghana has engaged on this project is that also a matter of interest in the in the questions that you're asking the bank of ghana to answer everything has become a, a, a subject of interest uh, if they respond to our questions uh, they should be able to give us the details because the first question we ask relates to the procurement processes and who the contractors are. So that will tell us exactly what informed uh, uh, the decision as to who should carry out the, the construction. So those documents are there. Now we expect to hear directly from the Bank of Ghana because um, Prima facie, the documents there point to uh, potential irregularities. Uh, it's up to them. Maybe there are other documents that we're not privy to, uh, documents that establish a justification. Maybe there are some expert reports that, you know, um, recommended certain things that we're not privy to. So the Right to Information Act and then the question that we put to them gives them an opportunity to explain to us so that we are not also acting in ignorance. So it's up to them to decide whether they want to be transparent or indeed um, there are things that they are hiding which uh, inform the way that they have uh, gone about. Because I recall that when questions were raised about why they were building, I mean, the Bank of Ghana was building the headquarters, the new headquarters at this time when they're facing challenges and to the cost of the $250 million as quoted, they give reasons why. And this is just one of many. Take a look. They said that the outcome of their structural integrity works was that the main building, that's where they are now, does not satisfy the full complement of excess strength required for a building to be considered safe for usage. And then they also say that in the case of the worst case gravity and wind loading scenario, for example, unusually strong winds, the building may be significantly affected and then concludes that if there is, for instance, unlike the current Bank of Ghana head office building built by the Nkrumah government in the early 1960s, the new head office can stand major earth, earth, earth tremors. So where they are, they say cannot withstand earth tremors and so on. So are you also asking for any data to at least put the doubts about their reasons giving to rest? Since colonial times, since Governor Gergisberg's time, I have not read any report that shows that a major earthquake or earthquake of any, you know, uh, what do you call it, uh, level has resulted in buildings in that neighborhood uh, collapsing. And so that is an unacceptable explanation for uh, burdening the bank and the people of Ghana with a $250 million new construction at a time when the bank itself is collapsing and you know registering huge losses and et cetera. So those reasons, in my opinion, are just untenable. I believe they just wanted to construct a new head office. And I think that people are not necessarily against constructing a new head office. There are new head offices that banks are building. Their neighbors are, I believe, Barclays Bank, that used to be there, now APSA. Uh, we have Standard Chartered Bank. They now have a new head office building. Uh, Echo Bank is there. They now have a new head office building, and etc. So banks are building new head offices. Uh, it adds to the beauty of the city. It, it provides additional uh, infrastructure across uh, uh, the city. So I don't think that people in principle are against deciding that 
you need additional space and you want to construct. But then if everybody else is constructing, you know, similar structures at average 40, 50, 60 million dollars, and then you choose to spend 250 million dollars to carry out construction, when we really don't think you have a good reason for for, for carrying out that construction, mm -hmm. but then assuming that you want to construct a new office, we think that it should be reasonably priced. And so when you start quoting figures such as $270 million, uh, $250 million, when we know others have constructed their head offices at average $50 million, some even less, $40 something million. Okay. Dollars. So if you don't hear from them in seven days, I mean the Bank of Ghana in seven days, w w what's going to be the next step for you, the minority? Well, we don't even expect them to take seven days to provide that answer because they definitely have the information. Let's wait till seven days and then we'll tell you what we'll do after seven days if they don't provide us with the answers to the questions that we have asked. Okay. Mama Yarga, thank you for your time. He is the Member of Parliament for the Boko Central Constituency. Now, Domahe Osajifo Osiadeyo Ajimabedu the second, has also waded into this, criticizing the construction of the new Bank of Ghana head office, describing the project as a misplaced priority. He argued that the funds could have been diverted into other critical areas. The Bank of Ghana. Bosiana Yakobana Amefono, Ucha Mutumi, Bank of Ghana and Guano, or the Mutu Vitamilian, or the Bako, or Cosidani. Hey, Nabani, make a separate Shabby Asinji, near Babana Bayo, Media Mentasia, Nanam Nocreni, Yasia, Yas on the Bank of Ghana says it is using two hundred and fifty million dollars to build a new head office. What is this? Because they are autonomous, they just choose to do anything they like. How can Bank of Ghana alone decide to undertake such a project? The best sermon, Pengini. Bank of Ghana, on your independent to say, on Friday, no one even to know who won. No one can be the papa be enjoy. We are appealing to the president to meet Bank of Ghana authorities as a matter of priority and undertake an investigation into the funding of the project. Na no kweni adio we di amini. Maka, Saban Pemwan Samanka, and then we don't want to be crowned by the bookwork and bookwork. Never who say any abre. Well, this is the mind there. Now, it's alive on Ghana tonight. Coming up next, uh, day one of the two day ECOWAS Security Chiefs meeting in Accra. And we, we tell you what issues were on the table for discussion, including the Defense Minister's call on army chiefs to remain loyal to their presidents. Now, let's, let's hear from Dominic Nitiwo, the Defense Minister, earlier today when the West African military chiefs. Um, met in a, day one of a two-day crucial meeting about what they intend to do in Niger. Take a look. You will put in place a plan to ensure that the standby force is activated and that democracy will be restored in Niger. If presidential guards in Guinea and Niger I will use the word take hostage their president. Nobody, and let me repeat, nobody in West Africa is safe. That is why I urge you to continue to be loyal to your heads of states. I urge you to continue to be loyal to ECOWAS directives and to give effect that the days that could the task enjoy the support of our people are over. Yes, in democracy people will agree to disagree, but the vast majority of our people in West Africa are with you. The vast majority of our people in West Africa do not want to be under the difficulties that we are facing today. 
Well, the head of the Peace and Security Unit of the ECOWAS Commission also reiterated that ECOWAS will not go and beg the military junta in Niger and that they would make sure that democracy is restored by all means in Niger. Take a look. We say no to military intervention. That is the issue. And the fundamental issue is that ECOWAS is protecting its protocols. Ironically, when ECOWAS deployed the standby force to the Gambia to make sure that a president who had lost elections vacated the presidency, nobody made noise. Today, they are saying, why are you intervening in Niger? You know, so serious interests are at stake here. But that is not going to divert ECOWAS' attention. Uh, we just want to tell them that uh, and inform them about the resolve of the ECOWAS of state and government to make sure that by all means available, constitutional order will be restored in the country. And this meeting today, best testimony to that. And People are telling us, where are we going to get the resources? So, ECOWAS is being teleguided by the West, it is being teleguided by France, it is being teleguided by anybody. So, quite a strong position there. But Emmanuel Bombande is Senior Mediation Advisor, Department of Political Affairs at the United Nations. He's joining us on Zoom. So, Bombande, thank you so much for joining us here on Ghana Tonight. So, you just heard the... That's Dr. Abdel Fatal there, the ECOWAS Commissioner in charge of political affairs and security. He said, by all means, constitutional order will be restored in Niger. Is that a, a path that you would also support, that by all means, this has to be done? Uh, thank you for inviting me. Uh, the emphasis, by all means, in my view, could be misleading. And to that extent, it's important not to present what is an absolute, absolute last option as if that were the option. I think the message of trying to use what has been described by the Commissioner for Political Affairs as, by all means, is basically to have a very strong and firm hand and to insist that ECOWAS will not relent. But for me, the language should exactly portray the ECOWAS political engagement through dialogue and mediation and not create a misrepresentation that the military option has now come to the fore. I say this for a very simple reason. What is the objective of ECOWAS? The objective of ECOWAS going back to its own protocols, particularly the one on democracy and good governance of 2001, does not present what you might call a military option when a situation like this arises. What it presents more is to use the type of preventable diplomatic efforts and negotiation and dialogue though in the repertoire of choices to make the restoration of constitutional rule could not deploy any other means that might ensure that constitutional rule is re-established. And so what we want to see happening is ECOWAS should carry itself more with the language of persuasion and appeasement. And whilst doing that, get the people of Niger on the side of ECOWAS to understand that this has nothing to do with the people of Niger. It's, it's about a military joint that has taken power and that has, uh, if you would call it, distorted, maybe distorted is light. It has truncated uh, constitutional rule in uh, Niger and that constitutional rules-based order needs to be uh, re-established. And the way to do that is not through military means. It is through the type of preventable diplomacy I have talked about. 
except that, as I said, the repertoire then includes, as a very last option, uh, such a use of force. I, I see, but you talk about preventable diplomacy, right? which some of you really have been pushing, that there's still room for that kind of diplomatic engagement. The military leaders in Niger refused to meet the delegation made up of the AU, ECOWAS, and the United Nations because they said they don't trust them. So how can the diplomacy be employed when there's so much lack of trust between these two, two, two parties? Diplomacy does not work because you try and then the party that you are engaging with refuses to meet you, and so it ends. Diplomacy is a political engagement that is persistent and that perseveres on a day-to-day -day basis. And so the first attempt for ECOWAS and the AU that did not work does not necessarily mean that diplomacy does not work. So they have to go back for it. But then they have to re-strategize. They have to enlarge the engagement. So you, we need to bring in more actors. We need to bring in the North African countries. We need to bring in uh, some bilateral and uh, multilateral institutions that uh, absolutely uh, are key players uh, in our region. We have to break down the understanding of interdependence and why we need one another. We have to bring the level of conflict analysis in terms of how the emerging future looks grim and put that before the military leaders for them to be able to see the contribution they are making, not just to peace in Niger, but to peace in the entire Sahel region and the entire belt of the Sahel from West Africa into the Horn of Africa. And all these must continuously be persistent and to engage. The Nigerian civil society must be engaged. Women groups must be engaged, the traditional rulers. And that makes it comprehensive. And to that extent, let us not have an attitude that suggests that because ECOWAS is the regional multilateral institution, it has failed in the first attempt, and it will not take uh, any ten less than to insist and to pursue in the use of force that in itself might not be what could be a good outcome in terms of the consequences that we cannot assess so the the damage we cannot assess but, so, but you see mr money look, looking at we've seen some of the chaotic scenes um in niger on our screens while you were talking but looking at the democratic status of some of the heads of state of ECOWAS who are even pushing for this military intervention in Niger. I've had some security analysts, like your, your colleague, Ken Fessor Sabuaji, say that, look, the likes of Togo and Ivory Coast, the, the, the leadership there have their own issues, democratic issues. And so they don't have any moral right to even be involved in seeking to restore what they call democracy in Niger. Would you agree with that? I do. Those are legitimate concerns. And it is precisely the reason why the ECOWAS standing has become weak compared to how ECOWAS, as we knew it in the past, was able to uh, engage. If you look at how uh, West African leaders could unanimously make decisions, that was um, but carried along with the people. There is no doubt that since elected West African leaders who swore to protect and preserve the constitution engaged in maneuvers and constitutional amendment processes that was meant to benefit them to have a third term and that equals in itself did not challenge their own peers who were changing these constitutions in order that they can preserve their power, equals then lost credibility. And so the, those concerns are legitimate. 
So two things must happen. One, the ECOWAS preventable diplomatic effort must be a, with the political will that projects a willingness to engage on those reforms which have been started but could never see the light of day in 2015 and in 2022 mm -hmm. some of these reforms including limiting to two terms every elected leader in west africa have not seen the light of day Absolutely. because some of the countries insisted that that should be left to the countries to decide thank you Zemano Bombande, appreciate your expert knowledge on this. And thank you so much for your contributions to this all-important conversation. Emmanuel Bombande is Senior Mediation Advisor and Department of Political Affairs at the United Nations. Thank you so much for, for staying up to join us here on Ghana tonight. T tomorrow is the final day of this meeting of the uh, Heads of Security of ECOWAS. So we'll keep an eye on that and we'll get to know whether there'll be a resolution on whether to go into Niger with the military intervention or what you, you have described as uh, careful diplomacy. But before we go, finally, uh, we've just received some information from the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. They say, because of the issues of the passports that we dealt with earlier in the week, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and Regional Integration wishes to inform the general public that it is working round the clock clear the backlog of passport applications and also sanitize the passport application process. The ministry uh, is inviting only applicants who have emergency cases to contact the ministry's client service unit. So via these phone numbers, 024-091-3284, as you see there, 024-079-3072, and 020-455-1723, and also 026-514-875. So while thanking the general public for the cooperation on this important matter, the minister also takes the opportunity to assure the general public that it remains committed to goes on to delivering enhanced passport services and so on. If you go on our page, that's 3news.com, and then also TV3 Ghana on Facebook, it, you'll see this statement there. The last bit says the public is advised to note that applications submitted to their regular offices do not come at an extra cost. It doesn't. However, Applicants have the option of submitting the applications to the premium offices, which attracts an additional 150 CDs payable in cash at the premium centers for the use of their service. The ministry counts on the cooperation of the public in addressing this matter. This is information from the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. So you could go on our Facebook page, TV3 Gun on Facebook. You get to see those numbers there and then you get through. And let's hear your feedback as well. Thank you so much for staying with us here on Ghana tonight. On behalf of the rest of the team, we appreciate your company. Join us same time tomorrow. I am Alfred Kansi. Have a good night. Ghana Tonight is brought to you by Flamingo Paint. Superior durability. Superior hiding. Superior coverage. Simply superior. This program is rated PG. It contains scenes of brief nudity, mild violence, and strong language. Parental guidance is advised. This program is brought to you by MTN Gluta White.